Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the 2023 Homeless Persons Memorial Day Remembrance. I did put in the chat that this is a this is a webinar, so people won't be able to speak. The participants won't be able to speak, but please feel free to put questions and comments in the chat. Um, before I introduce the first speaker, we're going to show a short video, and I just want to thank Kenya Mazarigos and the National Coalition for the Homeless for putting this together. I think it will give us some perspective and um, some real meaning of what this day means. On a single night in 2022, roughly over 582,000 people were experiencing homelessness in the United States. No one really knows how many people die each year in the U.S. without a home. The U.S. government does not conduct an official count of the number of people who die while experiencing homelessness. There is no national review or data collection for homeless mortality. The National Health Care for the Homeless Council identified 68 cities and counties that recorded the deaths of people experiencing homelessness in 2018. At least 5,807 people without homes passed away that year. This stark reality underscores the enduring impact of homelessness on health, well-being, and life itself. This is why in 2019, the National Health Care for the Homeless Council initiated the Homeless Mortality Data Workgroup to share best practices for data collection and planned advocacy. This supports the Council's work and the work and mission of the National Coalition for the Homeless to prevent and end homelessness through this Bring America Home Now campaign. Through advocacy and action, we will enter this time of memorial regarding people experiencing homelessness. Let us ponder how we as a compassionate and just society confront the long-term consequences of homelessness and forge a path toward a future where every life is valued. As we solemnly remember those who have passed, we also weave their stories into a powerful narrative that compels policymakers to confront the preventable tragedy of homelessness. Every lost soul represents a call to action, a beacon urging us to demand more from our leaders and from ourselves. One death is far too many. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just let you know that all the bios and photos of each of the speakers today can be found on the National Healthcare for the Homeless website, and that is nhchc.org, and we can put that in the chat. It's my pleasure today to welcome our first speaker, Donald Whitehead. Donald is the Executive Director for the National Coalition for the homeless, and he is going to give our opening remarks. Donald? Amy, thank you so much. And I, I thank you for your tireless advocacy uh, on behalf of the uh, Lived Experience Committee of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Uh, I'm Donald Whitehead. I'm the executive director of the National Coalition for the Homeless. And if you're with us for the first time, we thank you for being here. Uh, for Homeless Memorial Day 2023. Homeless Persons Memorial Day serves as a day to remember and honor those who have experienced homelessness and passed away. We chose the longest night of the year because it reminds us of the day-to-day -day struggle that our brothers and sisters face and the struggle they faced every night to wake up the next day. It also is a day where we bring attention to the challenges that families face without stable housing. 2023 marks the 34th anniversary of this event. Today, we acknowledge the men, women, and children, the mothers and fathers, sons and daughters who are no longer with us. We honor their existence, their legacy, their connections, and those that grieve their passing. 
many of us are all too familiar with grief and how it shows up in many different ways. It manifests in anger, resentment, and sometimes even joy. It indeed produces a full range of human emotions. It forces us to question our existence and our relationship with the individual. We often ask ourselves unanswerable questions like, could I have been more present in their lives? What work could I have done to change the outcome? We soon realize that we did what we could with what we had. I am reminded of a gentleman who called my office months ago, and I'll leave his name out, uh, but I've befriended him through his quest for those answers. This gentleman was searching for answers about his daughter who had recently died. He was heartbroken broken after learning that his daughter had become homeless and that his daughter had been cremated because she did not have an ID at the time of her death. He couldn't stop her, as he said, from moving to DC. And she didn't listen to his advice about carrying an ID wherever she went. I wanted to console him, but I could only share with him that it was not his fault. It was our failed and fractured system that was responsible. She was not responsible for her homelessness, and she did not leave Chicago thinking that she would end up in our broken system. She left with dreams and hopes, but those dreams were deferred and they were eventually turned into nightmares, uh, the nightmare of unsheltered homelessness. As providers and advocates and people who experience homelessness, we experience these emotions all too frequently. Every death moves us and we promise ourselves to work harder to stay longer, to find new interventions, to be better friends and protectors. We fully embrace that these deaths are overwhelmingly preventable. And if only we had the resources and political will to address homelessness to the scale of need, we would read many fewer names each year. Unfortunately, those who can change and reduce the names are not swayed by the loss of humanity. No matter how high the number, the response is always the same. For 34 years, there has been no response. As numbers have grown, the resources have not. Our elected officials, despite evidence to the contrary, including the ultimate evidence, the loss of human life, have not used a normal human reaction. Those with the power to preserve life has dedicated those resources to other priorities that they deem more important. Even when offered the proper prescription for prevention, they have chosen to ignore those solutions like permanent supportive housing and incomes that pay a livable wage. It has become more inconvenient to blame the victim for the demise than to the exam examine the strength of a safety net with gaping holes. Structural issues like racism, the lack of affordable housing, the lack of livable wages, and adequate health care are ignored, and myopic solutions like criminalization and forced institutionalization are the tools that delay the inevitable. Incarceration and criminalization has never solved homelessness and it never will. It only brings our members closer to the unnecessary despair and death that they face if they don't resolve homelessness on their own. Today, let us celebrate the lives and mourn the deaths of these individuals. But let us remember that we are the change necessary to stop the persistent drumbeat of despair and sacrifices. Let us remember that 34 years is much too long. And everyone, every one of these names is one too many. And let us remember the quote from Frederick Douglass that says, power concedes nothing without protest. It never has, and it never will. We must be willing to demand change. We must be willing to sacrifice, just as those before us have offered for issues large and small. We must be the voices for those that lie still today. Death is too high a price to pray for our silence. We must demand that housing is a human right and end the preventable deaths of our people. We must bring America home now and bring them home alive. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Donald. Our next speaker is the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Theo Harris. She's the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary, and she's also co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Reverend? It's an honor to be with everyone today. Thank you for uh, inviting me um, on this solemn occasion. As was said, my name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and I am the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, and the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. I'm uh, someone who came of age organizing with the National Union of the Homeless and have experienced homelessness myself um, and over the course of years, uh, of decades. Um, we have buried too many, just as we are still burying too many people who have been de de denied dignity in life. They're also denied it in death, um, folk that are too poor to die, um, but who are dying in this, the richest country to ever exist. We live in a country that has 135 million people who are poor or one small emergency away from poverty and tens of millions of people who are unhoused or inadequately housed. Uh, you know, in cities across the country, in towns across the country, we have five abandoned homes for every person that is unhoused, and yet people are dying on our streets. Um, you know, this is not okay. Uh, our Bible um, that I hold as sacred uh, speaks to the inhumanity of, of the situation around us. Jeremiah says, uh, you know, my people are broken. They're shattered. They put on band-aids saying it's not so bad you'll be just fine but things are not just fine we know things are not just fine um, in a country that can build a prefab house in 45 minutes um, uh, to have people living and then dying on our streets this is not just fine uh, we have uh, in in the bible uh, we hear about uh, jesus born uh, unhoused uh, nowhere to lay his head um, and and as he goes through life, he, he experiences homelessness again. Um, you know, in this Christmas season, we are uh, uh, seeing the kind of hard, hard times and suffering all around us. Um, and it just does not have to be this way. And so we must come together and sing together and pray together and organize together and protest together to make sure that we change uh, the, the moral direction that this nation is going on. And we, we house our people, uh, we feed our people, we uh, provide health care for our people, um, and we lift from the bottom so everybody can rise. I have some friends that have passed away this year on the streets of this rich nation. Um, and I say their names um, in remembrance as, as we raise other names uh, of folks that have gone before. Um, we know that people's death um, wasn't they were being called home by God, but in fact that we live in an unjust system, an unjust country, um, unjust society that uh, is happy making a profit off of our pain. Um, and this is not acceptable. And so we're going to come together and organize together and mobilize together to turn this around. Um, we said in the homeless organizing work I have come from and, and that uh, so many are still doing today, um, we may be homeless, but we're not helpless. Um, and that until we have housing, there will be no peace and justice in this land. So thank you for having me today. We lift up the names and the, and the stories. Um, and we know just like uh, Mother Jones said, we're gonna fight, we're gonna pray for the, for the dead um, we're going to lift them, we're going to remember them, um, and then we're going to fight like hell for the living, because we can do better, we must do better, and we can do so together by building a movement led by those that are unhoused, that are, are struggling, um, but who, uh, as Frederick Douglass said, um, who, who must strike the first blow, because we know when our pain was relieved. Uh, uh, this, this is this is a horrible situation that we're living in. It shouldn't be this way. Um, and so we will move forward together and not one step back. Thank you so much for your words, Reverend Liz. We really appreciate you being here today. 
Uh, next, um, we are going to show a recording of a painting by Tammy DeGrucci Grubbs called Christmas Eve in the Land of Plenty. In the gentle embrace of our collective memories, we come together to remember those who tragically found themselves living on the streets, facing the harsh realities of homelessness and whose journeys were prematurely cut short. In the quiet corners of our hearts, we hold space for each individual who experienced the challenges of life without a permanent shelter. Their stories, though marked by adversity, deserve to be etched in our collective consciousness with the dignity and respect that their lives inherently held. This is a line, the line the day before Christmas in our nation's capital. But this line is not just a line. Each figure represents not merely a face in the crowd, but a story, a narrative etched in the lines of weariness, echoing the struggles endured in the quest for survival. It is a visual testament to the longing for health care, for a place to call home, for the opportunity to break free from the cold, the violence, the constant day-to-day -day struggle to survive. It echoes the silent waiting for a job, for clothing, for a safe place to sleep, for a momentary escape from the harsh realities of the streets. As we remember those who stood in these lines like these, waiting for compassion only to lose their lives while waiting, let that image be a catalyst for empathy inspiring us to strive for a world where no one is left waiting in line for basic human dignities that we all deserve. A world where compassion is immediate and the waiting is replaced with action, understanding, and the acknowledgement of the shared humanity that binds us all together. As we remember those who tragically face the hardships of homelessness and have since departed, it is crucial to recognize these profound challenges they confronted in their daily lives. Each person we honor battled not only the harsh realities of living on the street, but also the societal indifference, systematic failures, and a lack of resources that compounded their struggles. Next, I would like to introduce Warren McGee. He is a regional representative on the National Consumer Advisory Board Steering Committee for the National uh, Homeless Council's um, home, uh, National Homeless <laughs> Council's um, Consumer Advisory Board, and he is also chair of the Consumer Advisory Board at the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. Warren. Hello, 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 everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Warren McGee, as Amy has instructed. I serve on the NCAB. I am also a regional representative for Regions 1 and 2 of the National Coalition for the Homeless Council. And my job here today is to basically give you a brief overview of what people are going through that are homeless, disabled, and have chronic health issues. About roughly, I don't know the exact numbers, there are about maybe 2.5 to 3 million people nationwide that are either disabled and homeless at the same time having medical issues chronic medical issues. And when they are out there in the streets during the winter seasons, spring seasons, summer seasons, fall season, there are challenges that they face every day, trying to keep up with their blood pressure, diabetes, um, other chronic illnesses, like for myself, I have cerebral palsy and I have a spinal cord injury. So it's three times harder for anyone that has to be confined to a wheelchair trying to make things work in your favor. As once myself being formerly homeless, I found the challenges 
along with my medical condition, were very challenging. And I'm here to fight for the voiceless that can't get up out of their chairs and ask for help uh, while they're on the streets uh, during these um, seasons, winter, spring, fall, and summer. And with all their medical chronic problems, everyone needs a hand somewhere, some way, somehow. So I think it is up to us as a community, doesn't matter where you come from, you can be from California, you can be from Florida, you can be from Maine, you can be from Texas. It doesn't even matter. As long as the voices are there and we shout loud enough to put an end to all this horrible uh, tragedy that the homeless community has to go through. Like I said, there's about roughly nationwide 2.5 to 3 million people dying on the streets. And at, at least 40 to 50 percent of those people are disabled with chronic medical issues. So come on, everybody, let's put a stop to this and let's make our voices heard that this can't keep going on. It has to stop. We live in a country that's supposed to be a melting pot of opportunity. We have to, sorry for the interruption. We have to make our voices heard to our leaders, our elected officials, that this has to stop. The homeless population are valuable just as much as the regular folks are. And so with my voice and everyone on this panel's voice, yes, we're gonna strike a mighty blow in this unjustified system that it can't go on much longer as it as we stated, one life lost is one too many. So come on, people. Let's get it together and make our voices heard. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, my friend. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Crossland. She's the Director of Homeless Outreach Development at Unity Healthcare in Washington, DC. Catherine? Thank you so much, Amy, and uh, good afternoon. I'm humbled to be speaking with you at this important event. As a physician with Unity Healthcare, I've had the privilege of caring for some of Washington, D.C.'s most vulnerable neighbors, an increasingly older population, people who often suffer from multiple medical illnesses, as has been mentioned before, people who suffer from mental illness and sometimes from the illness of addiction. On top of that, my patients suffer from homelessness, a disease of societal neglect. This is not benign neglect. This is intentional and malignant neglect with deep roots in otherisms, structural racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and the consequences are deadly. I often wonder when I listen to my patients share stories of suffering, suffering due to living in entrenched poverty, suffering from a childhood of abuse or neglect, suffering from untreated mental illness, suffering from the ravages of addiction, suffering from a life in and out of incarceration. I wonder, how did we get here? How did we get to this place where one person's life can be so devalued while others are lifted up? What choices have we made as a society to support certain segments of our population and neglect others? Most of my patients did not start out homeless, but somehow along the way, our society has failed each and every person who did end up homeless. We have failed everyone who lives and dies in a shelter or on a city sidewalk. 
I have seen the ways in which homelessness affects people's health and well-being. I have witnessed the perilous effects of frigid temperatures, which I fear will only worsen given HUD's recent data that unsheltered homelessness is rising. I have seen the aftermath of violent assaults suffered by my patients. I have treated countless patients during a global pandemic where many people contracted COVID because of their living conditions, because they could not isolate or quarantine. And, and many of those patients succumbed to COVID. I've also seen the immense challenges of my patients experiencing homelessness face and caring for their health. It is no wonder to me that the patients I care for die at ages earlier than the general population and that they are sicker at younger ages than their housed counterparts. And as has mentioned, been mentioned before, we don't even have very exact data about the numbers of people who have died this past year while experiencing homelessness. And it's so important that we continue to try to gather this data. Um, and thank you to the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council for doing this important work. So here we are today, we honor our friends and neighbors who have died this past year while experiencing the devastation of homelessness. We honor those two who died after being recently housed. I grieve for those people I've had the pleasure to know and care for, and I grieve the loss of those I never knew. Often at memorial services, there is grief, but there is also celebration of the life lived by the loved one being honored. As I reflect on the beautiful souls I have known, I remember their beauty and their resilience and the challenges of their life circumstances. But today, as we remember the lives of these souls, I feel more sorrow than joy. I grieve the conditions under which these neighbors of ours lived and died. I grieve that a 77-year-old man died alone on a frigid night in early January. I grieve that a 66-year-old nurse suffering from mental illness who was living in a shelter died after being physically assaulted. I grieve that another patient of mine in his 60s with severe heart disease died at a shelter without the comfort of close friends and family. And I grieve all of the people who died during the pandemic because they didn't have a safe place to protect themselves. I grieve that we as a society did not do a better job caring for them. There are many organizations in my city that do tremendous work reaching out to this vulnerable population, but often it is too little too late. We need to do a better job at every step of the way, investing in all members of our community from birth until death. I often say that housing is health care, and it is. Housing provides a safe haven against the outside elements to be protected against random act of violence. Housing offers a safe place to store life-saving medications. Housing provides a sense of dignity and humanity. It is unacceptable that so many people have died without the dignity of a place to call home. But housing alone is not enough. Not only should we fight for housing for every member of our community, but we should also fight for adequate social services, mental health care, substance abuse treatment services. We should fight for an end to poverty and for a living wage. We should fight for people to have the dignity of a place to call home and to enjoy the great wonders and beauties of this country. It is not enough to survive. In this country of immense wealth and opportunity, we should aim for every member of our community to thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do every day. We're now going to uh, listen to Spoken Word by Charlotte Garner. Charlotte is a regional representative with the National Consumer Advisory Board Steering Committee. She is also the chair of the Ellen Daly Advocacy Committee and chair of the Healthcare for the Homeless Houston Change Committee. This is an original piece by Charlotte. Remember the love. Come let us take time to remember the dear souls that have gone on home. Let us cherish their precious memories for each was surely one of our own. We've set us blaze the candles to carry on their life's light for their souls have merged with the stars in the heaven 
to be adored in the calm of the night. They shared their special kind of joy as only they could give, though they rest in the bosom of Abraham, by the love in our hearts they yet live. For to be absent from this old earthly body is surely to be present with Christ. And thinking from that point of view makes death seem a small sacrifice. For they suffered greatly while in the earthly realm the immense pain of being without. But there's a sweet relief for every one of them. Of this one thing I have no doubt. So we've set aside this time to memorialize all those who've gone on before and to give adoration and praise to our Lord whom we truly adore. Weep not, I say to each of you, for this is a just cause to celebrate. For I find joy in knowing without a doubt. I find and know there's a reason to shout. I'll see a familiar face at the pearly gate. Though each is now a citizen of God's kingdom, a member of the heavenly host. There's a new home for each of them. And they come down as angels to keep watch over us whenever we remember the love. This is dedicated to those who transitioned during a time in their life when they may not have had anyone or anybody. But those of us who are here know that in our hearts they yet live. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Madeline Carvin, National Youth Division intern, Bring America Home Now at the National Coalition for the Homeless. Madeline? Hello. Um, so this fall, I've had the honor of interning with the um, National Coalition for the Homeless, and it's been a wonderful experience in learning how important it is to highlight these issues of homelessness. Um, so I'm going to be reading a piece about our call to action. Today we honor the lives of the people we've lost, remembering the fighters forever in our thoughts, memorials for victims of institutional negligence, their lives are the cost of our lack of attention. We make efforts for progress to pick the pieces up, to change what's broken, to provide peace among the chaos. But we need to do more, go over and above, because thoughts, prayers, and bootstraps won't ever be enough. How should we find hope in the midst of our sadness when the losses of us should never be recovered? How do we stand to best serve the masses for all those who must have home? We must make a call to action. To end the suffering, ignorance, and bitter disregard for those who have gone, it is not deserved. History has shown us we've done it all before. We'll make others our family and end this war for warmth. We will honor the lives of the people we've lost by educating and uniting, drawing youth to the cause, active with injustice and loud with an accountability. Change is demanded. Shelter is demanded. Brave, we're commanding and we are rebranding to a world where policy isn't a dictation of whether someone has a home to feel safe in. Now is our time to do more than simply hope we can now see our purpose is to bring them home. Thank you. Thank you for that, Madeline. Next will be Bahavna Kula, also a National Youth Division intern to bring home now, bring America home now at the National Coalition for the Homeless. Bahavna? Hello everyone. My name is Bhavna and I work with the National Coalition for the Homeless. 
It is such a privilege to hear from you all today, and I want to thank all of our organizers, speakers, and attendees for making this possible. As I've worked with ICH partners, meeting many of you at the conference earlier this year, I'm constantly reminded of a favorite quote from Hairspray. To know where we're going, we have to know where we have been. Learning about the collective efforts, trials, and successes of advocates across the country has been incredibly inspiring as we step into this next chapter of increased youth engagement. As a member of Gen Z, many of us in this generation have come of age in the midst of a firestorm of crises at the intersection of public health, environmental risk, school safety, racial justice, and much more. However, we are uniquely equipped and ready to face these complex issues more than ever. Youth community involvement is rising higher every year and has reached record levels within the past five. As a generation in a more digitally connected world than ever, we are particularly attuned to understand how seemingly separate struggles impact us all. Our power is in our ability to understand and find shared strength in this interconnectedness. With over 46% of college students experiencing housing insecurity, and thousands of grade school students without a permanent address still struggling to get consistent access to a quality public education, ending homelessness is not only an aspirational goal for us youth. It is something that we must work towards to ensure our peers and our own present well-being and future success. In just four years, millennials and Gen Z will become the majority of the electorate, and we will be able to directly exercise our voting power at the ballot box. However, we have the tools and the resources and the community now to drive the change that we want to see within our communities. So I hope you will join me and all your fellow partners to be part of the generations that end homelessness for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bhavna. We're now gonna see another um, piece of artwork, a painting called Charlie by Tammy DeGrucci Grubbs. As we gather here today to remember those who walk the challenging path of homelessness, let us remember that each person we honor had a unique journey marked by trials that many of us might find difficult to fathom. In our remembrance, let us strive to see beyond the circumstances to the individuals they were. People with dreams, aspirations, and a profound longing for a connection. Allow me to share a story about my friend, Charlie. Charlie was introduced to me by Michael Stoops, my project director from the National Coalition for the Homeless. In a conversation about how he wished to be portrayed, if someone were to tell his story, Charlie expressed a desire to be known as an unaffiliated applicant for private sector funding, rather than a panhandler or a homeless man. Michael often drove him to my art exhibits where he spoke at openings sharing his experiences. Charlie was a man with a sense of humor and he faced the harsh realities of homelessness with resilience and determination. During a question and answer session, a lady asked him if he wanted to be homeless. His emotional response demonstrated his vulnerability and his strength. Do I want to sleep on a cold pavement? Do I want to be invisible, chased away in sweeps? Do I want to use the restroom in public to have to guard my friends at night, to be safe, to be beaten on the streets and walk in cold, wet shoes. No, I don't want to be homeless. I want to be human. Charlie lived in DC and spoke a truth that resonates with many experiencing homelessness. I asked him, what message do you want me to give the people when I speak about you and about homelessness? He took a moment with tears in his eyes and he says, tell them that we're dying out here and we want to live. Sadly, he passed away on the streets of DC. Homelessness in its stark reality is not just an individual struggle, it's a reflection of a systematic challenges that are demanding our attention. To honor the memory of our friends, let us not only remember the struggles, but also the inherent dignity that remained intact despite adversities. I often think back to Charlie's answer, no, I don't want to be homeless. I want to be human. Charlie embodied a profound humanity that surpasses the understanding of most individuals that I've encountered. 
Charlie was more human than most humans I know. As we carry the memory of those individuals forward, let us propel us to advocate for a world where compassion meets action, to foster society where embraces every individual as human. In the spirit of hope, let us remember Charlie, who despite his challenges, became my guide in teaching me about hope. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Bobby Watts, who is the CEO of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Bobby? Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you, everyone. I've been so inspired by your words, and um, I am really honored to be here for this solemn and important observance, remembering people who have passed away while experiencing homelessness. I've been asked to speak for a few minutes on the theme of hope, and I wanna ground my remarks uh, around two words. The first one is remembering, and the second one is, is hope. And remembering is to have or to ha bring to one's mind an awareness of someone or something that one has known, seen, or experienced in the past. The secondary definition, very closely tied to it, is to do something that one has undertaken to do or that is necessary based upon what one remembers or what one knows. We are here remembering, and it's so important um, that we remember those who passed away because many of them otherwise would not be remembered by most in society. And in many traditions, um, someone never dies as long as they are remembered. It says someone, the Jewish tradition says that someone dies the last time their name passes from someone else's lips. So we will be remembering, we will be calling out names and we will be remembering those who have passed away so that it moves us to action. I've been asked to speak about hope, not as a counterbalance to the righteous indignation that we have heard over a totally unacceptable and intolerable state of affairs in our country, but as a complement to it, that we don't only look at the intolerable situation without also looking at the things that give us hope and the reasons why we have hope. So hope means to cherish with anticipation or to expect something to happen or be true. And hope is a fundamental human emotion that helps us to stay optimistic and motivated in the face of adversity. It is often associated with positive outcomes and can help us overcome challenges and achieve our goals. Hope is an essential component of human life and can be found in various forms, such as religious hope, social hope, and personal hope. Hope can be a powerful force that drives us to take action and make positive changes in our lives and in the lives of those around us and in society. Both of these words, remembering and hope, are necessary for the change that we want to see. They are necessary, but not sufficient. So first want to just look at why should we have hope? One, simply, we have not forgotten. As Donald said, this is the 34th anniversary that we have been observing this. We could have given up in the face of adversity, but we persist because we have hope that things can change and just by continuing to bear witness to our neighbors, to our friends, to our loved ones, we are showing that we can and we will persevere. Second, we have more and more people who are remembering. We have more observances of uh, Homeless Persons Memorial Day around this country and around the world. And that while that is not sufficient to bring around change, it is necessary for people to see the scope of the problem, how drastic it is, and how completely unacceptable it is. As a public health professional, I tend to look at systems and uh, how systems are working, the health of populations, and there are a few bright spots there. Though there are way too many people experiencing homelessness, we should not forget the people who have been moved out of homelessness into housing and into a better life. 
According to the government statistics, last year, 8% more people were housed than the previous year. Almost 300,000 people that are known, according to the HUD report, were put into housing and undoubtedly many, many more. So while it is not enough, we should celebrate that we have people in our midst whose lives have been changed through the work that we have done, through advocacy that we have done that have made things a little bit better. It also proves once and for all that homelessness is a solvable problem. We know what it takes to bring people off the streets, out of shelters, and into housing. We just are not doing enough about it. But we have hope because we know that the problem is solvable. I also have tremendous amount of hope because most importantly, many of those who understand the experience of homelessness the best through their own lived experience are taking leadership positions in the fight to end homelessness. Not only have these heroic individuals climbed a mountain out of homelessness, but they are reaching down and helping others up the mountain. That gives us hope and we should be expressing our gratitude for all of them. Martin Luther King said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, but it doesn't bend by itself. As Donald quoted Frederick Douglass, power yields nothing without demand. It never has and it never will. So as we take these essential elements for change, remembrance and hope, let's remember that while we symbolically have chosen this, the first day of winter, the longest night of the year to remember those who have died while experiencing homelessness and to commit to act and bring about change so that their passing will not be in vain, we should also remember that symbolically the night doesn't last forever. And in fact, starting tomorrow, we will have daylight a little bit longer each day, Re reinforcing symbolically to us that we have a little more light in which to do our righteous work of loving our neighbors so radically that we are making our society more just by showing the example of what we can be in part because of what has been done and that we would bring love and have our society truly love every human being in our land. I thank you for participating with the National Coalition for the Homeless and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council in remembering our fallen neighbors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bobby. Our next speaker is Ishan Akula, National Youth Division intern and leader of the Bring Home America Now at the National Coalition for the Homeless. Ishan? Thank you. Hello to everyone here who is attended here today. My name is Ishan and I work with the Bring America Home Now campaign. Before we start, I want to urge everyone to please remember the people and the names you heard mentioned here today. Everyone I see here understands the pain and heartbreak that comes with losing a loved one. As we transition into a new year, we cannot leave behind the people, words, and actions of 2023. We have to carry them forward and show the world that in 2024 and beyond, homelessness will not take any more lives, lives that could be saved if we choose to act now. Deaths caused by homelessness will not be another statistic that grows year after year. For many, homelessness is a lifestyle chosen for them by the system they live under. And for millions of others, it's a paycheck away from a living reality. So where do we go from here? In the words of the great MLK, faith is taking the first step, even when you cannot see the whole staircase. No one can say for certain what the road ahead looks like. So we must be the ones to pave that way forward on our own terms. This time, the lives of Americans will not be swept under the rug. We have to organize. We have to teach people that homelessness is not a fact of life, but a crisis that needs to be solved now. We have to educate the younger generations that are growing up in poverty, thinking there's no other option. 
And I have told this story once before, but I have to tell it again. If you look to our past, all the way back in 1960, Greensboro, North Carolina, four young college students, just four, took seats at a whites only lunch counter. Despite doing nothing but ordering lunch, the police were called. But these police were powerless because these kids did not hurt a single person. They were simply ordering lunch that day. And the simple stand against the norm, the Greensboro sit-in, sparked dozens of student protests and swept 55 cities across the nation. The voices of young people can be so loud and we have to use them. We have to dream big, bigger than the people who called the police that day and bigger than the laws and groups that have oppressed people identified as poor, homeless, or otherwise marginalized for decades. We have to raise our voices to move forward our dream and what should be a reality of housing for everyone. And so before we leave here today, I want us all to take a moment of silence for the departed. These are only a few of the names we have captured for this year's memorial service. There are so many others that are not going to be shown here today. Please look at each of these names in silence and we will come back together once more after the video.
Ishan, I wanted to ask you if there was anything else you'd like to say. I just want to know that, um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for coming here today. And I also would like to thank the organizers for making this happen. And um, I just want to make sure that looking at that list of names, that we leave none of those people behind in 2023 but instead we make sure to carry them forward with us as we push to end homelessness in 2024 and onwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ishan. And thank you to your colleagues uh, for being here today. We really appreciate you. That is the end of our program. I also wanna thank the National Coalition for the Homeless and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council for putting this together, for hosting this event, and for everyone involved in um, planning the event. We need to continue to fight. We need to remember that homelessness is only a piece of our journey, that we can overcome it. We had lives before homelessness, and we need to strive to make sure no other people die on our streets. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you coming. Have a good evening.